Well, hello, church family. Uh, Pastor Frank Suglio here. Just wanted to reach out to you and kind of explain uh, some of the things that the Lord has burdened us with to do during this time uh, of uh, seclusion here during the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, one of the things that I challenged the church family to do uh, our last Sunday together, and that was to pray about what the Lord would have for us to have our, as our next steps coming in the year 2021 in our Christian walk, and especially through our church, uh, uh, through our church family. And so what we decided to do, uh, what the Lord burdened us to do here, is to, to do a podcast uh, basically outlining and discussing uh, the next steps in the Christian walk. And so uh, we, we as a pastoral team talked about this, and Pastor Mix gave us the go-ahead, and so I got Pastor Morales here with me. And so basically what we're going to do is every day uh, between now and Vision Night, which is now January 20th, uh, at 7 p.m. on Wednesday night, um, we're going to release a podcast discussing uh, a next step in the Christian's walk. And so, uh, Pastor Morales, uh, everything going okay for you over there today? Everything's going well. I am feeling better, little by little, and uh, I'm feeling the best I have felt since last Wednesday today. Amen. Recently. Amen. And, and if you have not yet heard Pastor Morales' sermon from last Wednesday night, uh, I think it is so fitting for these times, and so I would encourage you to go on our website and uh, look that up and listen to it. And so we know, obviously, that this may not just be uh, our church family listening. We're, we're making this with that in mind, uh, but please feel free to share this uh, with anybody that you think uh, you know, the Lord burdens you with to share it with. And so uh, as we were discussing this, as we were talking, uh, you know, Pastor Morales and I kind of came up with a list of next steps, and of course we understand that before we take a step, we must first stand up, right? And so um, in order for us to, 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 to take a st any step in the Christian walk, we must first be born again. And so Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by this faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And so the, we're going to focus primarily this week, or there today anyways, on salvation. And so, Pastor Miles, what do you think about that, that, that standing in the faith? I, I like the analogy of physically standing up before you can physically take a step. And spiritually speaking, we must be in Christ before we can make, make forward movement or take forward steps. Amen. in his will for our life and the first Corinthians 16 13 says watch ye stand fast in the faith quit you like men be strong and so we, we need to be standing in Christ we need to understand that first and foremost Galatians 5 1 says stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage you know I like the fact that it says that once we're in Christ we're standing uh, we're standing literally in the Lord and before Amen. God as a saved individual. Uh, we're not to be entangled with the yoke of bondage, the things of the world. We are to move forward. And hopefully this podcast can help our church family to understand, hey, where's your next step? Uh, now that you're standing in Christ, if you are, if you're saved, if you're not, then that's the first thing you need to do is get saved. Amen. Uh, I look forward to uh, all these podcasts. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and that's that's great. Those verses uh, hit home perfectly when in, in saying, you know, we want to we want to continuously be maturing and growing as a Christian, and, and none of us have nor will arrive until we get to the other side of eternity. And so, uh, this very humbling words coming straight out of the scripture there that once we're standing in Christ, we must continuously be going forward. And so, one of the things that I was burned about, Pastor Morales, is because uh, since we really started going back out into the community and inviting folks back into the church house. Um, you know, this past fall, uh, we've been blessed to see eight people trust Lord, the Lord as Savior. And so that's really exciting. Um, but one of the things that I noticed was two, if not maybe even three, um, had already previously made professions of faith. Now, you and I don't really think about things like that because we got saved a little bit later in life, and so it, it, that was not our lifestyle. Uh, where many of the folks that are going to be listening to this grew up in church. And so with the, you, all your experience in ministry, have you seen that many times where uh, people made a profession maybe at a younger age and then really weren't truly uh, saved? Yeah, that, that is a... I would say it's common, even though I haven't seen it a ton. Uh, I have seen it several times. Uh, I'll give one quick... Uh, one quick testimony, I had a fellow who I taught when I first started teaching a children's class way back in, I want to say, 1998, 1999, um, and he had been saved, had been in the church, you know, before my wife and I had, and him and I went visiting 
uh, we went, we led people to Christ together. We, uh, you know, we served together, reaching those those young people. And years and years and years later, I'm talking, I don't know, 10, 15 years later, you know, I'm, I'm on staff, I'm an assistant pastor, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, you know, I've been in the ministry, you know, years at this point. I see him following the Lord and Believer's baptism, and I thought, wait a second, what, what's happening here? Mm-hmm. You know, this guy who I thought was saved, who I thought, you know, was, was in the fold, was standing in Christ. Yeah. Well, I asked, I questioned him after the service, and he said, these were his words, he said, I wasn't truly saved. Hmm. I, I didn't really know for sure that I was going to heaven. And he didn't say the fact that he was faking it, but the implication was there. Mm-hmm. You know, it was implied that he had basically been just going through the motions prior. And I thought, wow, man, that's incredible. A man who's serving, who is seeing people saved, um, you know, in the church three times a week, going out soul winning. I thought, how can that possibly happen? But He's not the only one that I've seen, you know, that happen, and, and, it, and unfortunately it does. And so we need to make sure that we're in Christ before we decide to do anything else. Amen. The very first thing is making sure we're saved. Absolutely. And, and there's no there's no shame in that, right? I mean, it's no, not... absolutely not. It's, it's, absolutely. A, you know, it's a matter of from this day forward, moving forward. And so I'm it, sure... To me, it was shocking. It was shocking, but right. I was grateful that, hey, I'm glad you got it covered. You got it taken care of appropriately, scripturally. Uh, and that's the key, not not basing your salvation on someone else's, you know, witness of you trusting Christ as a five-year-old. So that's good. That's really good. Our, our oldest daughter did the same thing. She supposedly got saved, you know, as a five-year-old, but then at 12, she wasn't sure. She didn't know. And so she made a profession of faith, and she believes that truly she was saved at 12. Now, she could have been saved at five and, and not totally understood it, but I told her, I said, I'm... I'm glad I wasn't. <coughs> excuse me. I wasn't upset with her. I wasn't disappointed in her. I was glad that she knows that she knows that she got it covered and she got it cared for, uh, and, and it's cemented in her heart. That's the key: Amen. is making sure that you've done what God is telling us that we need to do to, to be saved. Yes, absolutely. And yeah, and I've seen it many times over as well uh, at, at Cleveland Baptist when we were still there. And so we, I think I think part of it is um, you know there's many people that are probably listening that that maybe truly are born again. Maybe they've never made a profession. Maybe they have. And so our desire obviously is that they would trust Christ. But I'm sure there's another group of the population that might be listening to this that truly was born again, but maybe they haven't done much in their Christian walk, and, and maybe they don't have the scriptural backing to really cement it, and that's why they haven't moved forward. And so our, our our desire for them is that they would they would uh, understand. Um, I, I heard a, I heard an evangelist at a at a revival say a couple of years ago, "Are you one hundred percent sure that you're that you're going to die? If you were to die today, you'd go to heaven." And can you prove it to me scripturally from the Bible? And I thought that's really good, you know. And and so um, there, because there's confidence in that because it's the Word of God, right? And so uh, our desire for those people that they would that they would uh, cement that as well. And so I, I would say the the biggest thing, you know that we have to first understand and really start is uh, the, the, f- the phrase born again. You know, we use biblical terms like born again and saved. Mm-hmm. And, and the bottom line is, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 3, uh, when Nicodemus was talking to him, he said, Very, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He went on in John chapter 3, verse 5 to say, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. He, he also said, he must be born again, I believe in the, in the next verse. And, and so, if you can't explain what being born again is, you really have to, to take time to really pay attention to the words that we're saying here, uh, the rest of this broadcast, because um, ye, Jesus said, you must be born again. Not that you, maybe, maybe you should. It wasn't a suggestion. It's it, you must. And I believe that's the only time in Scripture that Jesus actually said, you must anything. And so, um, what, what do you think about that, Pastor Morales? Well, you know, uh, the key for salvation is is being born again. And, I, you know, I, I find it very humorous in that passage in John chapter 3 where Nicodemus asks the Lord, well, how can a man be born when he is old? This to me is just, it's, it's, it's God showing us his humor. You know, can a man enter the second time into his mother's room and be born? Obviously, that's physically impossible. But it's humorous that he would ask because he says, I don't understand. What does that mean? And the Lord is telling him, he's saying, no, you must be born physically one time and then be born spiritually 
that second time, that, that second birth, uh, that being born again is a spiritual uh, transaction. It's not a physical transaction. Yeah. And, you know, there's people that, that are, the, the phrase born again has been tainted, has been almost, you know, treated as if, you know, it's it's charismatic. And listen, it's Bible. Well, it's, um, it's biblical. And, and if we're not born again, now being born again doesn't mean that we speak in tongues. It doesn't mean that we have, you know, gifts to, to heal people. Although, in some cases, it's, it kind of gives that connotation. But biblical, Bible born again is being saved, is, is having placed our faith in Christ. And uh, if you have not done that, you, you, you can't take the first step. You, you can't yeah. go, you can't be baptized. You should not be baptized, scripturally speaking. You should not be, you know, a member of a church. You should not be tithing. You should, although, you know, obviously we'll take your tithe, but um, <laughs> that's not, that's for Christians. That's for born again people. That's for saved individuals. Amen. And we yeah. have to have that first. Yeah, and to be honest with you, you know, in my unsaved life, a man who grew up in church, that if you would have asked me, do I believe in God and Jesus is the Son of God and the Bible is the Word of God, I would have said absolutely, for sure I do. But if you ask me what being born again was, I thought it was a de denomination. I thought it was a denomination of the Christian faith yes. because you know, I just didn't know. And you don't know what you don't know. And uh, you know, the man Nicodemus that we're talking about here, this was a man that would have said, I believe in God. He was serving God. He was, he was, he was a wealthy man. He was the pre eminent teacher of his day, you know, in teaching the scriptures, of course, the Old Testament at that time. And so you could see how if you're listening to this, and, and I mean, none of none of us would, would say in our unsaved life that we were at the level of Nicodemus, and if he needed to be born again, that each and every one of us must be born again. And so what I struggled with most, Pastor Morales, was the word believe, you know, because I think we use the word believe a little bit differently today than, than, than the Bible uses or intends it, right? And so... Um, you know, typically, when we say we believe, we're really saying, I believe it's possible, it could happen, right? And, and the Bible's saying, no, 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 when you say believe, it's I'm 100% sure, I'm putting all of my faith, all of my trust into what it is that I'm, I'm believing in, what my faith is in. And there's a difference there. And so a couple of verses that I want to go over, because I think a lot of them, including myself, uh, would, would, would kind of stick to, especially in America, because we, we were under the mask of we're a Christian nation, and, and because you know, I grew up going to church, I believe, you know, quote unquote. And so in John chapter 3, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so I think a lot of people just take that verse and say, Okay, well, yeah, I believe that, and I must be good. And again, obviously, what we're going to go over today, it's much deeper than that. Right. And, and, and we're, going to, we're going to cover that at length. It goes on to say in verse 17, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And here, here verse 18 is key, and, and nobody ever talks about it, right? Because we always talk about ver, verse 16. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Again, cementing the fact that you're not... You're not uh, born with this knowledge. You must be born again. Of course, we know that there's the age of accountability and, a, and an infant that dies. Scripture tells us, as David said, that he will one day go to be with his child in heaven. Um, but, but, but once we reach that age of accountability where we understand and, and, can, and can make a decision on our own, um, you know, at that moment, we're condemned already. But, but when we believe, then, then we pass over from condemnation and so so what are your thoughts on the word believe biblically as opposed to in 2021 here in the yeah, United States so, of America so I'm looking at our notes and I see that John 1 12 and 13 are a little bit further down for points so I want to save that for then but that would apply here mm. you know but as many as received him to them gave uh, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe there, there's a twofold purpose in, in believing it's not just a mental assent because Romans chapter 10 verse 9 and 10 tells us that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation so we must not just mentally acknowledge the facts and the, and the details about the Lord Jesus Christ we must literally place our faith in those facts that's the kind of believing uh, that the Bible is talking about 
it's not just saying, yeah, go ahead. If I may ask you to share, uh, for, for, for those that don't know, uh, Pastor Morales is my mentor. He discipled me uh, very, very detailed uh, in, in Florida, not only scripturally uh, of the Bible and the scriptures, but also how to study it out, how to share it. And we did a lot of soul winning together. Well, I mean, he did soul winning. I stood there and listened. <laughs> but, but we spent a lot of time doing that. And, and, and this illustration, which is a true story, right? And I've used this many times in, in preaching, but I, I think it's, I mean, it is the, the best way to describe really the difference between yeah. biblical belief and scriptural belief. And so if you don't mind, and again, I know, and, and here, I mean, let me just say this. The, we, we are planning these podcasts uh, to be uh, much shorter in time than this one is going to be. So please, moving forward, uh, the other steps will be a lot a lot uh, quicker. Uh, but we do not want to disservice the Lord and the scriptures in the, something as, as important as salvation. So we're going to take our time with this and allow the Lord to work. And so if you could, Pastor Morales, share with uh, our listeners the that that uh, that illustration that so perfectly describes biblical belief as opposed to yeah. uh, you know earthly belief. Yeah. So the story goes uh, of a man named Sean Gravelet. Uh, he was a Frenchman. They called him the Great Blondin. I've used I've told this story so many times in the last twenty years. Like you know. Um, That's why I felt like I could put you on the spot with this. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've told this thing so many times, uh, and I've I've investigated. I've looked this up. It, it actually did happen. So Jean Gravelet was a uh, tightrope walker, the best at the time in the world at the time, in the late 1800s. And uh, he advertised that he was going to go to the Niagara Falls in upstate New York there, or western New York rather. And he was going to tightrope across the gorge of Niagara Falls. Now, I always, every time I give this story, I say, I've been there. My wife and I visited there. Uh, most people have either been there or have seen pictures of it. They understand the concept of the gorge really large hole in the ground with, you know, hundreds and thousands of gallons of water falling, you know, uh, per minute, per hour. I don't know the exact figures, but nonetheless, it's a dangerous thing for him to attempt to do this. It's a, it's a daredevil type act. Uh, and he sure enough did this. He type roped across the gorge. Uh, he type roped across the gorge uh, with a wheelbarrow. He filled that wheelbarrow uh, with either dirt or who knows, potatoes. He filled it with something. Uh, and then at another point, he took his manager, put him on his back, and type up across the gorge, each time making it more and more difficult. And uh, there was an audience that was there, uh, and they, they watched him. They applauded him. You know, they, they were wowed. They were just totally uh, taken, taken aback by this, this man doing these things. And I say to the prospect when I'm speaking to them, I say, uh, imagine now, that actually did happen, but imagine, pretend with me in your mind that we were there. Pretend that... Uh, we were in the audience, we went to see this man, and we see him do these these tremendous acts. And he comes back to us as part of the audience, and he says to us, he says, how many of you people here in this audience, here's the key word, believe, believe that I, John Grave, the great Blondin, as he was referred to, can type rope across the gorge of the Niagara Falls. Well, I say to my, the prospect that I'm speaking to, that I'm trying to witness to, I say, well, if I'm there physically, you know, in our imaginary story, if I'm there and I saw him do it with my own two eyes, when well, I would raise my hand and say, well, I'm sure I believe you can do it. I just saw you do it. Of course. Uh, why would I not believe? And then uh, pretend that the man asks us, us the second question. He says, how many of you believe, he word, believe that I, John Gray, with the great blonde, can type rope across the gorge of Niagara Falls with a wheelbarrow and something inside the wheelbarrow? Again, if I'm there in our imaginary story and I see it with my own two eyes, I would raise my hand and say, well, I, I believe. I saw you do it. I believe it. Then he asks us a third question. Which one of you here in this audience is willing to climb inside the wheelbarrow so I can type up across the gorge with you inside the wheelbarrow? And at that point, I say to the prospect, I say, I'm not going to raise my hand for that. And why would I not? And more than likely, they wouldn't either. I would say that to them, well, you probably wouldn't either. And generally most of the time they say no I wouldn't and I say why would we not raise our hand it's because we're afraid that when we get in that wheelbarrow he would go to type rope across and he would make his first mistake and both of us would fall to our death you see the difference there is we believe he can do it we believe he has the strength he has the wherewithal he has the power uh, he's done uh, he's, he's rehearsed he's, he's trained uh, he has everything necessary to do that and to make that happen we believe it, but we're not willing to place our life and our well-being in that information, in his hands. So if we're not willing to place our, our life in his hands and trust him 
and trust his strength, trust his strength, trust his ability, then we believe it here in our heads, but we don't believe it in our hearts. And that's the difference. I, I, I often, uh, each time I tell this story, I go to the prospect and I say, now see, that's the difference between believing in the Lord Jesus Christ in our heads and believing in the Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts. Because there's many people on planet Earth that believe the facts, the details about the Lord Jesus mm-hmm. Christ, that he was the Son of God, that he came, uh, that he was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless and perfect life, that he died for the sins of the whole world, that he was crucified, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, uh, that he ascended to heaven eventually, that he sits at the right hand of the Father. Many people, many people believe these facts, this information about the Lord, but they're not willing to place their faith in those facts. They're not willing to say, well, I've placed my eternity mm-hmm. in the fact that he died, he was buried, and he rose again for my sins, personally. They're not willing to place themselves, spiritually speaking, inside the wheelbarrow of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a huge difference between believing it in our heads and believing it in our hearts. And we must make that transition. For me, it was November 28, 1993. I had never heard the gospel. I heard it. And eventually, 24 hours later, I transferred the information from my head to my heart. Amen. And, and that's what everyone must do. That's when we're born again. Uh, it's not when we say a prayer. Too many people you know, put that's emphasis right. on a prayer. Uh, and I'm all for prayer. And, and we do, we do uh, uh, confess with our mouth by praying. But when we're saved is when we believe in our hearts. And that's, that's what we have to do. That's and right. if you haven't done that, man, you have to do that. Yeah, the Lord, as Pastor Sudio said, he said, ye must. You must be born again.